so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters this podcast was recorded on. Joe DeFlew is standing at the entrance to Strathfield Plaza in Sydney's inner west, but he can't go in. It's an ordinary Saturday. His wife is by his side. They don't usually come out this way, but they needed something from this particular centre. So here they are. But the thought of taking another step leaves Joe panicked, worried, out of breath. He simply can't do it. This doesn't usually happen to Joe. As a forensic pathologist, he's used to dealing with things other people find morbid and traumatic. He literally examines dead bodies for a living. Usually, he's able to wipe his mind clear at the end of a day. But something about the victims of the 1991 Strathfield massacre has stayed with him. It was lunchtime on an ordinary Saturday in August 1991, when Wade John Frankham sat in a cafe at the Strathfield Plaza and drank a coffee. A few hours later, he pulled out a knife and proceeded to stab a teenage girl sitting behind him. Pulling out a gun, he killed five more people sitting in close proximity. As he fled, he shot the cafe owner dead and killed the seventh person he came across in the centre. After fleeing to the rooftop with police in pursuit, he shot himself. The whole thing only lasted 10 minutes, and Joe was tasked with doing the autopsies on the seven victims. He thought he'd compartmentalised it, but standing here, in the same place they died, he realises he didn't. As a forensic pathologist, he prides himself on being able to professionally detach But today has been an important lesson. He too is human. And some cases are impossible to forget. I'm Gemma Bath and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. Joe DeFlew has seen a lot of dead bodies. In his 40 years as a forensic pathologist, he estimates he's done about 200 autopsies on average a year. Sometimes the people on his table have been the victim of a crime. Sometimes they've simply died unexpectedly and he's been tasked to find out why. As he'll tell you, The job is not like what you see in the movies or in Criminal Minds. He doesn't help with the whole solving of the crime thing. His job is to find out why and how someone died. He's the facts guy, the numbers guy. Joe has seen a lot in his career. But even now, he comes across crimes and cases that surprise him. He joins us to take us behind the scenes of forensic pathology. Joe, when I think of a forensic pathologist, I think of Ducky from NCIS. Murder? No, natural causes. Myocardial infarction two days ago. Ducky, then what's he doing here? How different is your actual job from what we might see on TV? What we do is not CSI. (laughs) You know, it's absolutely not like that whatsoever. The autopsy to begin with is quite a low-tech type of investigation. Do you pull the bodies out of the mortuary door and do it right there? In no, the, no, 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 okay. no. We have effectively an operating suite. So bodies come in on trolleys. Yeah. Usually it's walk-in refrigeration areas, so large rooms where bodies are placed in that room in body bags. We don't solve crimes. That's not what we're about, and we definitely don't solve them in 45 minutes, you know, with 15 minutes of ads. You know, that's not going to happen. (laughs) Have you ever seen a crime show get it right? Yes, I have. Very early on in my career, 
they had a TV series called Quincy. And essentially, Quincy was a medical examiner, forensic pathologist in Los Angeles. It was really good. It was based on forensic pathology stories. So the writers of the show actually got input from forensic pathologists. And effectively, they told their stories with a fair amount of fictionalising. Who would have thought that actually speaking to the people who do the job <laughs> yeah, would help ex- inform how to actually do <laughs> yeah. the job on screen? And it was really well done. And after a while, quite a while, a few seasons, they actually decided we don't need these people anymore, these pathologists. And the show went right down the gurgler because the stories no longer made sense. I've given advice in a fair number of crime shows and books that are written, you know, novels, that type of thing. And I think it's really important to get the story right. You know, just some of the detail at least. Because if you don't get it right, well, you're not only going to have a forensic pathologist saying, you know, that's wrong. (laughs) You know, but those people watching these shows and reading the books, etc., they actually pick it. You know, they know when you're talking crap. I think it's important to have as accurate as possible accepting that it's fiction. Joe, when you were growing up, you wanted to be a doctor. What you've ended up doing now is a little bit different. Look, I'm very much a medical practitioner. I approach my work as a medical practitioner. To say that I work with dead people and that's it, not quite. I actually do a fair amount of living work. So if you look at it, injuries that have killed a person, versus injuries in a person that's still alive. They're often a matter of degree more than anything else. They're still injuries. You can still make interpretations of those injuries. So that's point number one. Point number two about it is that a lot of what I do is, in fact, trying to find diseases, injury patterns, that type of thing, to help the living. So effectively, I'm treating the dead, to look after the living. And probably if you look at the area that I'm most enthusiastic about in forensic pathology, it's the identification of inherited diseases, usually diseases affecting young people, often cardiac, so inherited cardiac diseases, people who drop dead while playing sport, that type of thing. Those to me are the real challenge, trying to find out what they died of Is there anything that other family members had? And if they've got it, is there any way they can be treated? That's really, you know, a big area that I'm involved in, an area that I'm very interested in. Is that something you've come to later in your career? Where did you start? Mm. I did medicine pretty much as everyone else did, six years of medicine, that type of thing. Really thought, this isn't for me. I just didn't like patients at all. So it was a matter of what can I do now with this medical degree, having spent six years of my life. And it was a matter of, well, what doesn't involve patients directly? And really the alternatives were then radiology, but no chance of getting into that. Medical administration, you've got to be kidding. (laughs) (laughs) Anesthetics, that, that had potential, but all positions were filled for that. And in the end, I started looking around everywhere and landed up been told by my boss, the medical superintendent, have you thought of forensic pathology? I've always wanted to do forensic pathology. I said, oh, you're kidding. There's no way I want to do forensic pathology. That's a horrible subject. And in the end, to make him happy, I made a phone call. You wouldn't have a job for me, would you? And the answer, when can you start? So there Is we that are. because forensic pathology isn't an overly popular area to go into? <sighs> Look, it's something that a lot of people want to do. And then when it comes to the crunch, they don't want to do. You know, it all sounds very exciting, very romantic, you know. And then they sort of realize, you know, it's sort of comes with dead bodies and smells, horrible things. It comes with unhappiness. You know, you don't get people saying thank you for doing an autopsy. And then to make matters worse, you land up going to court and you land up being abused by lawyers. You know, I mean, they're doing their job. It's, you know, it's nothing personal. But when they cross-examine you, 
They have a point of view. You might have a point of view. They try and break down that point of view. Can you take me into an autopsy room as a forensic pathologist? What exactly are you doing from Mm. start to finish when you enter that room? Well, I think it's somewhere to begin with. It's somewhere between an operating theatre and a laboratory. Okay, so as a pathologist, I work in a laboratory. The techniques that I use, a lot of them are surgical techniques. So I examine my patient like I would any other patient. So the first thing I do is I take a history. Okay, now obviously my patient doesn't walk into the autopsy suite, but I get information and I get that from all sorts of places, mainly from police who've done an initial investigation for the coroner. I might have medical records available. I might have photographs. I might have other information. So I first look at that. And that is my history of the patient. Now, if you think about it, when you go and see a GP, they actually quite cunningly ask you what's wrong with you. They ask you what your diagnosis is. You might not quite view it that way, but they ask you what's wrong. They ask you a few questions and narrow it down. Now, by the time they've stopped asking you questions, they're about 80% certain what's wrong with you. So a huge amount of the diagnostic information comes out of the information you tell your doctor. You know, I've got a sore throat. I've got a bit of a headache. You know, I'm feeling slightly short of breath. I've got sputum, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, obviously it doesn't involve gout in your toe. <laughs> you know, that type of thing. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's like that with a lot of medical questions. You sort of try and narrow down to the area that you're concerned about. So... By the time you finish telling that five-minute story, 80% of the information is there already. You then have a medical examination, also known as a viewing of the body, an examination of the interior of the body, a dissection operation to look at what's going on inside. And at your GP, of course, you might have the application of a stethoscope. Listen to that chest. Do you have a lung infection at the same time as just an upper respiratory tract infection? You're now sitting at 90%. So that medical examination, be it the autopsy or the examination of the patient, is another 10%. You might then be told, look, I'd like you to go and have some blood tests, maybe an X-ray, whatever. Okay, by then, we are hopefully sitting close to to 100%. In the autopsy, you might land up doing microscopy of small samples that you've taken. You might do toxicology. You might do various other lab tests. And hopefully you get to 100% as well. And then you get to your final diagnosis, which you tell the patient or which I write in a report and tell the coroner. So in effect, it's very, very similar. You say that, but but you are dissecting a patient. Okay. Yeah. Immediately. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let me go into some detail on how you do an autopsy. After getting the information, you then do an external examination of the body. You examine the body from top to toe, see if there are any injuries or any other abnormalities on the surface of the body. There might be indications of various disease processes. So after you've done that, and depending on the circumstances, you may do an internal examination of the body, you may not. And if you do an internal examination of the body, you may look at just one area or extend it to the whole body itself. So if, for example, a person's complained of chest pain, said, oh, my God, oh, my God, the pain, the pain, the pain, it's radiating into my left arm and down into my fingers, gets short of breath and collapses. That's probably a heart attack. Yeah. Okay. But if they've never had any indication whatsoever of heart disease, That's a typical type of case where you land up being referred to the coroner and the coroner would order an autopsy. Now, if I find evidence of a heart attack, that's when I stop. I'll probably do microscopy as well on the heart just to make sure what's going on, how long it's been present, that type of thing, any pre-existing conditions there. But I wouldn't necessarily need to look in the head. I wouldn't need to look in the abdomen, you know. You don't have to. And and in general, when it comes to autopsies, if you can do less, you do less. Because it's for the coronial autopsy in any event, it's not consented. Okay, unlike pretty much all of medicine, you ask for consent from the patient. The patient gives consent after being told what it's all about, and then you do whatever is required. 
with a coronial autopsy, you don't ask for consent. Okay, it is a directed examination by the coroner, the judicial officer in Australia, and the coroner tells you what needs to be done. Is there any instance where you would do a full body autopsy? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your typical example is a suspicious type death, a homicide, that type of thing, a complex type of case where you're not quite certain what's going on. So as an example, back to our heart attack case. I look at the heart and there's nothing wrong. Absolutely normal looking heart. So, oh, well. You then keep on looking and you keep on looking. And I'd go from the chest, I'd probably next go into the head, just make sure there isn't something like a stroke or a bleed of some type or something going on there. And then I'd go into the abdomen. I'd do lots of investigations until I get somewhere with it. It's accepted that probably in 2 to 5% of sudden death cases, you will not find a cause of death. The autopsy isn't a sensitive enough technique to find a cause of death in those cases. We work very hard on not getting to that stage, unfortunately. You mentioned before smells. Yes. Is that a question you're asked often? I mean, it's a surgical room, right? Does, yes. Is there a okay. smell? Look, it depends on the nature of the mortuary. I've been to some mortuaries internationally that have been horrible. Really? Yeah, you know, truly horrible unhygienic, dirty, flies, et cetera, et cetera. I have not been to any in Australia like that. Australian mortuaries are very clean. They get thoroughly cleaned every day after autopsies. In homicide cases, as an example, they'll be cleaned before the homicide autopsy has started and the whole room will be bleached to get rid of any extraneous DNA. So, you know, again, it depends on the type of case. But mortuaries in Australia, it's been my experience, are pretty much universally very clean. You don't particularly have odours. Did it take some getting used to dealing with dead bodies? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I recall the very first autopsy that I watched as a medical student. The premises weren't air-conditioned, and it was a a warm summer's day. Mm. Yes, I think it's fair to say that the pathologist who was doing the demonstration was boring. (laughs) He really was boring. (laughs) He was droning on and on and on. And I was standing there together with about 10, 15 other medical students. I wasn't feeling well, you know, and I think it's fair to say I started swaying, which is always a bad sign. And, And then at a crucial moment, he made a cut into the body to show a specific abnormality. And... I knew I was about to faint. I could just feel it. Except just behind me was another medical student and she just went cathud on the ground. Yeah, And it sort of broke the spell. She beat you to it. Yes, she did. She absolutely (laughs) beat me to it. I know I would have fainted, (laughs) you know, but because of her, I didn't faint. I'm eternally grateful to her. I won't tell you her name, (laughs) but I am so happy that it was her and not me. So, yeah, that was the very first post-mortem that I watched. So it's confronting, yeah. In the end, I suppose the way to view it is it's a medical procedure. You're there to find out what's going on, what happened. You know, it's like any other medical procedure. The next time I nearly fainted, I've got to tell you, was when my wife had her first child. You know, again, I would have fainted. Yeah, when I saw blood, I nearly fainted. (laughs) You. No, I had to walk out of the room. Yeah. I guess it is a very different experience. <laughs> but well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it is. It's a very individual type experience, you know. And you might do, I've done tens of thousands probably of autopsies. And yet, when it came to childbirth, which I'd seen lots of before as well, I just couldn't cope. Was it because it was someone you knew, someone probably, you loved? Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever had to do an autopsy on anyone you knew? Look, it's certainly the case that I've been asked to do an autopsy on someone I've known. And if that's the case, I will make that known and work hard on there being no conflict if it's still a matter of me needing to do that autopsy. Would you prefer not to? Or does it not bother you? It's a patient. 
and I approach it as a patient. You know, some patients you know as a doctor, some you don't know. I've been asked as a favor to do an autopsy on a relative. And I view that as an honor. Really? Yeah. It's not something that I necessarily want to do. I wouldn't put my hand up, but being asked, yes, I thank you for asking. And yes, of course I will. It feels like you have a different relationship with the dead than perhaps someone like me who would be quite, I think I'd be too upset to do something like that. Dead people look different to live people. You know, they they don't have that soul, that emotion, that life. Trite maybe, but, you know, they're, they're very different. I suspect it's in many ways like a surgeon doing an operation. To the surgeon, you're a patient, mm. you know, and you're hopefully doing the right thing and solving the problem, whatever that might be. An illness, you know, on the part of the surgeon or trying to work out what's going on on the part of a pathologist. You're listening to True Crime Conversations Behind the Scenes of Crime Special with me, Gemma Bath. I'm speaking with forensic pathologist Joe DeFlew. Up next, we'll dive into some of the cases Joe has worked on. I want to talk more about the crimes that you've mm, kind of yeah. helped investigate or look mm. at the bodies for. Can you give me a run through about how you might be brought onto a case? Mm, yeah. Okay. So it may start with the visit to the scene. That happens less often than it used to. Essentially, I think it's because crime scene officers and police have been trained more and more over the years. And at the same time, you've got the problem that the pathologist has a specific job to do. I must say, I, I quite enjoy going to crime scenes. You get a feel for the case. Does it yeah. give you more context? Well, it does. Yeah, yeah. it does. And I think that is important sometimes. After saying that, yeah, you know, you might get a couple of hundred photographs beforehand. The people who were at the scene will tell you what's going on. If there's ever a need to go to the scene, there's no problem with attending the scene, you know, often after the autopsy. But that's where you start. Again, you land up with information on what happened, you know, what the circumstances were. Well, you know, the, the initial police investigation. If there are any weapons that are suspected, you may be given either photographs of the weapons or the actual weapons or maybe a similar weapon. So as an example, in a shooting, the police have libraries of guns. Wow. You know, and if it's a Glock pistol, they'll get one from their library and show it to you. So is the idea that you're trying to match the wound to the yeah, gun? Yeah. So there's certain aspects of wounds which can be of, of relevance to that specific gun, besides caliber and all that, or the size of bullets, you name it. The length of the barrel might be important. So let's imagine you have a 1.5 meter barrel between the, the muzzle and the trigger. Now, if your arm length isn't long enough for self-infliction, that sort of excludes you, doesn't it? Yeah, right. Okay, so, so that's a possibility. On occasion, you might actually see an imprint of the muzzle wherever you've been shot. Now, you can assess range, that type of thing. Those type of things are really quite useful. Knowing what a knife looks like that caused the stab wound, as an example, especially if there are multiple knives and you need to make an assessment of which is more likely, what type of knife could have been used. You know, was it serrated? Wasn't it serrated? What was the width of the blade? How long was the blade? That type of thing. And then, of course, there, there are all sorts of blunt objects as well that could have impacted with the body and left a very specific pattern on the body. So that's all very useful. Invariably, when it comes to a homicide type autopsy, you'll also do a CT scan of the body. And that provides you a lot of information concerning the bony injuries. It's often quite hard to get to some bones in the body, like for example, in the face itself, let's say the pelvis, parts of the spine can be really hard to assess. But a CT scan can be very useful in that. So, so you get all that information beforehand. The autopsy itself in a homicide, takes anything from three hours to a couple of days. Really? Yeah, depends on the circumstances. 
effectively most of the time will be spent doing an external examination, just looking at the outside of the body and describing injuries. And, you know, it can be a very long-winded process, you know, every injury described in detail where it is, you know, its exact nature. It's then photographed and photographed again, you know, then with scale, without scale, sometimes with flash, without flash, special lighting, you name it. So it can can really drag on forever. And do you work alone in that instance? No, no, no. I never work alone. I I will always have at least one assistant, usually two, who assist in moving the body around for me. They then do most of the cutting and sizing of the body. I then look at the organs themselves. I don't like puzzles. I'm really bad at them. (laughs) Really bad. Do you like them? Do you like when it's a challenging case? Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, I think what's actually made me like forensic pathology, and for that matter why I don't like clinical medicine particularly, if you go to your GP, you know, it's 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and that's it. For me spending a day, two, three days on a single case, you know, trying to work out what's going on and then explaining what's going on in court, you know, and trying to get your view across to jury members, the judge, the lawyers in a way that's understandable. I think that to me is much more satisfying than seeing patients every few minutes would be. Do you find you form almost relationships with the people that you've worked on to then be able to fight for how they died or their case? Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, and I think the answer is no. (laughs) Okay. I have to remain detached, for better or for worse. I do an autopsy. An hour later, I've effectively forgotten what I've seen. If I haven't recorded it, usually on a dictaphone or drawn it and written it down. Yep, I can't remember it. I think that's probably a good approach, not least because also you you have a case bleeding into the next one. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's a bad term. <laughs> but, you know, the information diffuses from one case to the other and by the time you finish now, what case was that? You're trying to produce a report and the two can get horribly mixed up. So that's why I do a case, effectively wipe my mind and then do the next case. Are there any victims or cases or crimes that have stayed with you? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, it would be silly to say that you don't remember cases. So lots of cases over the years, some just well-known homicides, others great personal tragedies and yet others from a medical perspective, absolutely fascinating. So, you know, take your pick, which homicide? I'd love you to tell (laughs) me about the Strathfield Massacre from 91. I know that that was one that did stay with you. It did, it did. So what what happened with that was that a spree killing took place where one person, I think, killed six people at a cafe in a suburban shopping centre. He then abducted a woman in a car, and shot himself in the parking lot of the shopping centre. I went to the scene. I was so gee, okay. That's a, you know, you see what you see. And it was quite confronting, but that was about it. I did the autopsies together with the two of us as pathologists did the, did the autopsies. There were some interesting aspects, you know, and, so, and you know, horrible injuries. And that was it as far as I was concerned. I Move on. Months later, my wife and I, for some reason, had to go to Strathfield Shopping Centre. I have no idea why. But anyway, off we went to Strathfield Shopping Centre. And as I approached it, tried to walk in, I couldn't. I just had this overwhelming anxiety. I just could not walk in. And I suppose what I was having was a form of PTSD there. And I examined myself in detail as to now what's going on. I I sought some professional help. I mean, obviously, this this is a problem. And effectively, what we concluded was 
most homicides, you can sort of rationalize in some way, you know. It sounds horrible because it's victim blaming, and I don't want it to be that at all. But in your mind, you can rationalize. Okay. Now, if you look at the Strathfield Shopping Center, what happened there for me was people on a Saturday afternoon were out shopping. There were a whole lot of people who were sitting in a coffee shop having coffee, and they just landed up getting shot. They were absolutely uninvolved in anything, and they got shot. That's the reason why it affected me, you know, that, that I could, in fact, identify with the people that died. So when they were on your table and you were doing the autopsy, it was almost they were removed from that, so you, yeah. you could compartmentalise it? Yeah, more? absolutely. So, yeah, when I did the autopsies, I was just doing the autopsies, as, as I do usually. I had a job to do and that was that. It was interesting, years and years later, there was a homicide in another shopping centre. And I actually tried very hard not to go to the scene. Police wanted me to attend the scene. And I said, okay, I said, you really sure you want me to attend the scene? I'm not so sure. I said, no, look, we'd really like you to attend. And I was really worried about attending because I didn't know how I'd react. Would I be able to do it? And I actually told police when I arrived, look, I'm not trying to get out of this, but this is why I'm worried. We went to the scene and I actually felt it was okay. You know, so I think I've been able to cope with that episode of PTSD. Maybe I've compartmentalized it again mm. <laughs> further. I don't know. I haven't been to that shopping center since. I don't know if it exists still, so, and I'm not going to. <laughs> but yeah, that was certainly a case that affected me and not in the way that I like being affected. But it sounds like that kind of thing doesn't happen very often for you. No, it doesn't. There have been very few cases where I've looked at a case and really felt personally involved in some way, you know, for whatever reason. And I think it's important as a forensic pathologist, I think, as a person who investigates anything, that they have a fairly dispassionate approach to it. We are not advocates. That's up to the lawyers. We're not out to get someone. We're just trying to find out what happened. You know, and we use our tools, which is essentially medicine, to try and get to the bottom of a case as far as we can. I want to talk about Peter Keeley. Yep. It was a case you worked on. Mm. He was a Canberra auctioneer. He was found dead and bound in New South Wales in mm. 2020. Can you tell us about how you were called in and what you were asked to do in that case? Yeah, look, I was called in by the defence and I was asked to look at the report by the pathologist who did the autopsy originally, look at the scene as well, or photographs of the scene, and see if there were any alternative explanations that were reasonably possible. The basic story was of a man who was bound and gagged and then left in bushland. He had some injuries, but the injuries, I think we all agreed, were not severe enough to on their own cause death. He had illicit substances in his blood, which are very hard to interpret in terms of did they cause death or not but they could have, they could have contributed to death. There was a major issue with the gag and how it was placed over the mouth and nose and whether, in fact, it was still over the mouth and nose when he died. So if he died after the gag was removed, he couldn't have died of suffocation. He also had some head injuries, mainly of a concussive head injury type, so he had concussion from being beaten. And the microscopy of those head injuries gave you an indication of the minimum length of time that he would have been alive for after he was struck. It was then a matter of detailed information as to the movements of these individuals 
when they could have done it, et cetera, et cetera, to try and work out a time of death. And based on all of that, my conclusion, and I think in the end it was accepted by the court, was that it couldn't be said with certainty that the deceased had died of suffocation or a head injury or methamphetamine overdose. And I think, to a certain extent, on that basis, the judge decided on a not guilty verdict to murder. And of course, the important thing is, with these cases, the fact finder, it was a judge alone trial here, has to be convinced beyond reasonable doubt of it being a homicide, a murder. And he was not persuaded that it was. What about you? You also need to be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that your testimony is right. And it's such a... Okay, no. In in some instances, it's hard to tell. Okay. My job is to provide information in a truthful manner to the best of my knowledge and ability. If you look at how the defence has to go through a case... They don't have to prove things. If they show there's reasonable doubt, that may be sufficient, depending on the circumstances. So if I get asked, are there possible alternative explanations, and I can identify reasonably possible alternative explanations, so not pigs might fly alternative explanations, but is this a reasonable alternative, then that might be sufficient in that case. You see, if that gag was not over the mouth and all we had was, well, then being able to breathe, concussion and a level of methamphetamine sufficient to be able to cause death, effectively that's the last man standing, isn't it? Mm. The methamphetamine. And I think this was uh, the issue that was gone through. It was an unusual homicide trial in that effectively it was almost exclusively expert evidence. So I spent three days in the witness box in that case, and a lot of it was done as concurrent evidence. So in other words, there were two of us sitting in the witness box together, effectively having a guided discussion. You know, one of us would be asked a question, there'd be a response. Then The other one might be asked the same question or it might be a matter of how do you respond to that answer. Do you ever get nervous when you're called up to court? Because basically you're having your credibility questioned on a stage. Oh, look, without a doubt, in the early days, I was a nervous wreck. It really got to me. It's actually quite different now, I think. Some days... I'd rather be anywhere but in that witness box, you know, so give me root canal treatment, you know, (laughs) as an alternative. But most of the time, to me, it's, it's an almost enjoyable part of the job because I'm now able to explain what I've decided for whatever reason, you know. In the end, if you write a document and nobody reads it, it has no value. Mm -hmm. But if you're able to use what you've seen to explain to people of relevance, the the jury, the judge. And it might have, hopefully, the right outcome. That's to me, is really very satisfying. Does it frustrate you when you can't write a cause of death down, though? To a certain extent, yes. Depends on the type of case. I mean, if, for example, you have skeletonized remains, a person found dead in their bed, you know, three years after last being seen alive and you find no cause of death. What about in a homicide, in a crime? Yeah, sure, sure. It happens, absolutely happens, where you might not be able to tell. And that's not a failing. It's a fact, you know, that you can't get around. So, for example, again, looking at the case we've discussed, you can have multiple possible causes of death. And in a situation like that, It's entirely reasonable to say, I don't know. It's one of these, potentially. 
yeah, the arguments for each one, the arguments against each one, you know, and I don't have a problem with that. The hard ones to me are the natural deaths in young people often where a person has collapsed, dropped dead, often with nothing preceding it. And you do an autopsy and you find nothing. You land up with those cases, what do you say, you know? I think is problematic for the family. If there's a strong indication to me that a person's had a sudden cardiac event, suddenly their heart stopped. If you look at sportsmen, running on the soccer field, suddenly they collapse. You do the autopsy, you find nothing. Almost certainly it's their heart that's had an abnormal heart rhythm. I mean, I'll, I'll give the cause of death as a presumed cardiac arrhythmia and then make the strongest of strongest recommendations that family members and specifically blood relatives go and seek medical advice, you know, from specialist cardiologists in that specific field. You know, it's sort of said for every death due to a known genetic cause that affects the heart, there'll be on average eight other members in that family tree who have the same condition. Oh, wow. You know, so if you can pick that case, you've got the hope of saving a whole lot of people by identifying it and making sure that their treatment is absolutely optimal. Joe, do you ever make mistakes? Or in hindsight, yeah. do you think you've made mistakes? I know I've made mistakes. We all make mistakes. If we think we don't ever make mistakes, we're mistaken. I've got some injuries wrong, some medical conditions wrong, some diagnoses wrong. It's the nature of medicine, I suspect. It sort of becomes a matter of, do I make a mistake when I come up with an opinion and the court rejects it. Is that a mistake? Or is that a point of view that is not accepted? And there's a difference between the two. Yeah. I've certainly had lots of those. I mean, I think you've got to remember that the medical investigation of a crime is a small part of the investigation invariably. The whole case needs to be looked at I'm not going to look at the whole case. That's not my job. Arguably, the less I know about a case, the better, according to some. Or the more I know about a case, the better, according to others. Take your pick who you've got in front of you asking the questions. You know, why did you need to know this much? Why didn't you know this much? <laughs> you know, you can never win with these cases, can you? But I admit fully, I make mistakes. Do you like your job? Yes. Initially, I didn't. I'd be the first to admit this. The first day was horrible, horrible, horrible. But, yeah, I actually got to like it. Would you encourage people to be a part of it, though, to be in your career? Do you think it's a good line of work to be in? Probably, yes. <laughs> um, I've never discouraged anyone. If for some reason you believe you have the aptitude to do the job and you've got the qualifications to begin with, so in other words, you've done medicine and all that, yeah, go for it. It might be the job for you. For most people, it's not the right fit. I accept that fully. But they're definitely those of us that either go into the field intentionally or land up in it accidentally, and I'm one of those. <laughs> you know, uh, it turns out it's great. For me, it's been a great career choice. Thanks to Joe for joining us on today's episode. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Gemma Bath, with audio design by Scott Stronick. Our executive producer is Gia Moylan. I'll be back next week with another look behind the scenes of crime. Talk to you then. <laughs> <laughs>